it's my honor this evening to be here. As a matter of fact, when I sat there, I remember my first encounter with Dr. Nelson, and probably the time when we became quite close was I spent a little less than a week with him at his home. My family went to be with him for uh, a season. We went fishing on, I think it was a branch of the Ryan, Ohio River rather, and we went bear hunting, deer hunting even though it was dreamy, bear hunting, but I was privileged to see and to feel some of the many guns that he has in the parks for West Virginia. And I am really missing him this evening. I've always looked forward to having him impart his great knowledge to us. I want to say a special thanks for the invitation to be here. And certainly I'm not too sure if I'm worthy to be standing here. At first I was somewhat uneasy when I heard I was to be reading a citation from him and doing his bit as Dr. Nelson. And was what somewhat relaxed afterwards when I understood that my friend Bishop um, Bishop McCoy would have been the guest speaker. And then I was disturbed that it was a guest in the morning <laughs> and that he would be here. But nevertheless, I am wearing two different shoes this evening. So if I walk a bit lean, you'll understand that if you're wearing two big shoes, you must walk lean. Praise God. Um, this evening, I'd like to leave a word with the graduates, but also with the aspiring uh, members of this institution. And I'm really impressed. I want to give all Sunday thanks to, is it Sister Cassia Simmet? Uh, Cassia, Cassia Simmet for the wonderful words. Not too sure where she get all those information. <laughs> Praise God. Um, and also to the musicians, I want to greet them. I was so thrilled with the wonderful soft music. And when I when choir was singing, I'm not too sure. You know, I get so, so, I don't know, I'm concerned. It seems like once you have put on the name of Jesus, you become a singer. <laughs> I wasn't too sure if these were ministers of the gospel or a choir. <laughs> but every time I've been, this could have been my third or so graduation, and uh, I'm always amazed at the level of singing that comes from the choir of the graduates. Amen? And I'm impressed. I am a singer myself. The difference is that I sing in my mind. And when it comes through my mouth, it is totally different from what's going on in my mind. But I'm still a sinner by mind. Praise God. So I usually say, yes, don't listen to the I, I can't understand the words. I said, don't listen to the words and the voice. Just listen to the song. <laughs> Praise God. I, I want to read a scripture and I promise not to be long, but I thought of this while I sat there and I'm gonna just emphasize this. Just to say to the graduates and those who are aspiring to be a part of this school, this institution, keep, keep on climbing. You are unstoppable. Keep on climbing. You are unstoppable. I examined the scripture of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, there were about five discourses of Matthew the first one being the call of the disciples, or rather, not the first, but the, yeah, the first discourse was the call of the disciples in Matthew chapter 10. And then there's the sowing of seed when Jesus sort of taught them about the sowing of seed in Matthew chapter 13. And the discourse was also in Matthew 18 when it speaks of humility. And the final one was the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. 
But the one I'd like to leave with us this afternoon is that of the last verse of Matthew 4, that's 425, and the first two verses of Matthew 5. This was a situation where they followed him, and it's the fifth verse of Matthew 4. They followed him a great multitudes of people from Galilee and from the Decapolis, and also from Jerusalem and from Judea, and far beyond Jordan. In the fifth chapter said, and seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, it's interesting to note that the discourse of what we consider to be the time of Jesus' greatest teaching, Sermon on the Mount, was really given to a special set of people. Many times we read it in our churches and we think it's given to the masses. But it was really given to those that dare to climb the mountain with Jesus. One of the reasons why I am convinced that that was so is that when you jump over to the end of the sermon, in Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 28, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had ended the saying, that's the end of the Same. sermon in the mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, not as Christ. Then chapter 8, the first verse, picks it up. And when he was come down from the mountain, a great book to follow him. The impression is here that when you go in a mountain experience, people will leave you. And dare you to get more knowledge and to get the real teaching of Christ when you decide to make the sacrifice and to just climb to a different level as you have done. You will find that you will be, it will be unraveled to you what Jesus Christ really means and is saying to your life. And that's why I say tonight, keep on climbing. You are unstoppable. Right. I want to note very well that those time takes some time to study the gospel. As a matter of fact, take some time to understand the Bible. Yeah. There is always a difference in blessings when you dare to go up to a mountain of experience. In the interest of time, I will not say what happened to Abraham when he dared to go up to the mountain. The revelation that was revealed to him that go beyond his generation and to show him that there is a place in the kingdom of God which you consider to be a local government of the kingdom, which is church. If Abraham had stayed in the valley, he would not understand the full kingdom of God. That in the midst of that great kingdom of God that go beyond even what we have here in earth, there is a local government known as the church. For us to understand that even where the ark was placed was of a mountain top experience. You ask Jonah, he will tell you that the more you go from God is the further down you go. But when God is ready to use you at a different level, oh, glory to God, he will pick you up from the low levels and give you a knowledge and a mountain top that will tell you that there is one God and that his name is Jesus. It may be just Peter, James, and John, but he will take you to that mountain 
where he's transfigured. And you will be taught what the prophet wrote about him. You'll be taught what all those of old and the law had said about Jesus. If you dare to go on a mountaintop experience to get the knowledge that Christ Insist, and insist that you receive. I sat there and I thought of a young man as I considered these graduates. A simple man. The Bible said that he was born in Alexandria. It said that he was versed in the scriptures. It said that he was eloquent. I mean that he was learned. He came to Ephesus about AD 49. What's interesting with this man is that he started to speak boldly in the Seneca. As if he know so much about Christ. I think our preacher meant one of our moderators meant mentioned that you can speak about Paul name, Saul name, being changed to Paul. And it sounds good. It rhymes actually. Yeah. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, how much truth is in it? All right. This young man was very eloquent. He was bold. He was speaking well. There was something in him that you have to admire. And there was a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla, yeah, who took him one side to instruct him more perfectly in the way of the Lord. It is telling me that you can know so much about Christ and think you know so much about Christ. But there is always another level to go through. Now, it does give me two to five minutes and most to show you a bit less about this man. Let me, let, let's make it quick. He was among those that Paul would have took in his hand after he was introduced to Christ through Aquila and Priscilla. He was instructed in the way the apostolic persuasion, the way of God, more, more, more eloquently or more precisely. And then he proceeded to go to Corinth where he met Paul. Acts 18 will tell you that he met up with Paul. He was there and was very useful in watering what Paul had planted. It's one thing to plant, but it's another thing to what? I once had an orchid tree when I just got married. Didn't know much about it, and I was so excited by this orchid plant. My wife loved plants, and I was thought I was doing well, I would water the orchid <laughs> every day. <laughs> My wife didn't know I was doing it. Nice husband. Yeah. I'm from the country. We water the plants. <laughs> Glory to God. But a little after, the orchid just too much water. This man was taught how to water by Paul who had planted. And he was with Paul in Ephesus when he first wrote the first epistle of the, to the Corinthians. And Paul made reference to him. As a matter of fact, in Titus 3 verse 13, you will see that when he was walking with the lawyer, Zena. Many of us believe that lawyers can't be in the church. Zena is Zenas was a lawyer according to Titus. And he walked with Apollos, and they were there as eloquent people. Don't let anyone tell you you can't have knowledge of the words. Don't let anyone tell you that you can study to show yourself. You read Acts on Titus chapter 3, verse 13. You see that these the lawyer and, and, and Apollos was, was they, they were valuable to Paul's ministry. And some would have supposed, that though without sufficient ground, that he was even the author of the epistle Hebrew. But what I admire about this man, after 